So welcome to our breakout session, how organic action plans can be a powerful tool to promote organic conversion by increasing demand for organics. I am Friedhelm von Meering, policy officer at BLV in Berlin. Let me first show you some important points concerning our netiquette. So please switch off your microphone and camera. And we are happy to see your questions typed in, into the chat in English, please, because that's the conference language. This session will be recorded, but don't worry, your identity will not be recorded. For listening, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about the translation services. I'm, I'm uh, afraid we have to stick to, to English uh, in this workshop. <laughs> um, so let's get started. You're welcome to join in, of course, by using the chat tool for comments or questions and by participating um, in a poll that we are doing later in this session. My colleague, Theresa Dune, uh, you can see her uh, um, uh, on screen, will be happy to assist you if you should encounter technical problems. Um, by the way, Theresa has been the one um, spending the last couple of months preparing the whole EUC, so a big thank you to Theresa uh, here. And now, without further ado, um, I would like to hand over to our moderator, um, uh, our session moderator, Lukas Nossol. Lukas is spokesman, German Association for Organic Specialized Retailers, IGBM. He is a founding member of eFirm EU's interest group, Organic Retail, and he is a member of the extended BOV board. In his everyday job, Lukas is responsible for the communication department at Denri, an organic wholesaler and retailer in Germany. So the stage is us. Okay, thank you, Fried, Friedhelm, and welcome, everyone. Um, there's one camera open from Renier Beach here. I don't know if it's pronounced correctly. Renier, maybe you can switch off your camera, please. So, and maybe another advice uh, on the top, you can uh, switch the, the cameras on to active cameras only, so you see the speakers um, quite large. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, so let me um, um, quickly inform you about the agenda before uh, we go on introducing the other two people in, uh, in front of everyone else. So um, we uh, end this session at uh, one o'clock sharp, and then you have five minutes time to switch on over to the uh, main panel again. So we have a short delay, but we We'll stick to one o'clock, so yeah, let's hurry up then. Um, our main aim is uh, to get a good impulse um, to, and, and ideas to pass on to the Commission. So I'm happy to have uh, Paul and Chiara here with me and with us. Um, at the end, we'll, um, we are planning to have a short call. I don't know if this works with GoToMeeting, we will see. So um, let me first uh, introduce then um, Chiara Faenza. Chiara Faenza is responsible for sustainability and values innovation in Coop Italy. This is one of the major Italian retailers. I think everyone knows um, Coop Italy and has always been um, a strong attention and made great investments in sustainability with focus on organic products. Uh, in the middle, uh, you can see Paul Holmbeck. Paul Holmbeck is the former director of Organic Denmark and should be well known to many of you. Um, he has been uh, 25 years developing organic food policy and partnership with retail in Denmark. And Paul is now director at Holmbeck Eco Consult, where he advises political, NGO and businesses leaders around the world on organic and climate policy. So welcome the two of you. Uh, it's nice to have you here. So uh, we start with one or two short questions and then we see if we have some good questions uh, coming from the, the audience. Uh, there should be time for questions, I hope, at least. So, um, Chiara, let's, let's start with you. Um, you're coming from Italy, so uh, I'm really interested in what are maybe the, the key lessons we learned concerning the governmental or EU policies uh, driving the organic markets in your country and maybe you could give us some of the best practices uh, you've witnessed in Italy maybe even within your company yes okay 
Thank you very much for the invitation. Just uh, very few words uh, about uh, uh, what uh, about the situation in Italy. Uh, just to arrive to the to the lesson learned. Um, in Italy, the political policies, especially focused on the supply chain at production step. And uh, you have to consider that for several years, we have been the European country with the best position in terms of number of farms and uh, a very important organic cultivated areas, more or less 50% of cultivated areas. And even today in our country, uh, there is an expansion towards this production method. What has been done? Uh, in Italy was defined from 2050 and 2020, uh, strategic action plan for organic production by institution and stakeholder working together. And uh, the um, policy the, the finding included the development policies. The strategy was divided into 10 strategic action with also operational solution. Of course, uh, political support uh, was uh, mainly directed uh, towards production. But uh, I, can, uh, I can note uh, some activities uh, that were also undertaken to, to support and spread the consumption of uh, organic products. Um, an important example uh, is the promotion in uh, 2017 of uh, organic food in uh, school canteens with specific rules, uh, with a specific, specific percentage defined, uh, and uh, very important, uh, not to forget, a dedicated budget. Um, organic food was considered as a preference element uh, in the tender documentation for schools. Um, in Italy, there was also, was also a tentative in 2008 to establish the, a public database of all commercial transactions to be more transparent and to tackle the fraud. Uh, but unfortunately, until today, it's not yet running. This is another very important element uh, just to involve uh, and to increase uh, the trust for the consumer. That is uh, one of the lessons we learned. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in 2019, uh, some uh, research programs, uh, especially focused on production step, uh, uh, has been ad admitted to funding, but uh, by our point of view, just to enter in the focus, uh, uh, the points uh, on which is uh, necessary, is important to focus on are, first of all, to define concrete time-bound action to improve the organic market. Uh, the, secondly, to have a specific and, if possible, bigger budget to be invested on organic uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, third, but not less important, to, uh, to push on transparency, to tackle the fraud, also implementing control and uh, by using innovative technology, also to increase, to increase the, sorry, the consumer trust. Because the last, but absolutely not the least from uh, our point of view, is uh, the communication to consumer. So it's very important to implement uh, institutional information consumer campaign because uh, uh, consumers, uh, for, uh, for us, uh, um, consumer awareness is a very important driver to increase the um, organic market and, of course, the sales. Just to spend some words uh, about the best practice of Coop, as you told, uh, we are one of the main Italian yeah. retailers. We have uh, 6.7 million members and a turnover around 30.4 billion euro. And uh, um, which was our strong point, so uh, where we invested. We um, follow two different uh, aspects. So we invested on two different aspects. So first of all, um, we wanted to uh, be recognized, more recognized and appreciated the product. And so first of all, we created in 1999 a brand for organic product clearly recognizable by consumers. Um, the brand changed sometimes over the years, but always maintaining its property of uh, identification. And uh, secondly, we push, we implemented a strong communication about it. And actually, which are the result. Uh, and the reason why I uh, underlined the importance of the, the consumer, because actually our Cop Verde line is composed more or less uh, by 630 SKUs for organic food, and the number is increasing. But uh, this line is a reference point in, uh, in the Italian market and in our, uh, uh, in our stores. Uh, this line is the best known purchased and appreciated cop line together with the premium line, the Fiofiore, okay, is another line. So it is a uh, 
considered at the same level of, of a premium quality product. Okay. Okay, thank you for this experiences. As I can imagine that this, uh, this brand then also um, provides some transparency to all the customers in Italy with this high value. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Paul, um, let's come uh, over to Denmark then. Yeah. I mean, Denmark, Denmark is very well known um, for being one of the leading countries um, regarding organic sales. It's not, uh, not only one of the leadings, but it has, it has the biggest share on organic product sales um, all over the world. So I'm really um, eager to hear from you um, the answer on the same question. Uh, what, what are the lessons you, you learned from these 25 years? How, how mm. could Denmark achieve it? And I have three minutes. Yeah. Um, greetings from Denmark and thanks for the opportunity to contribute. I think Denmark is, uh, is a good case for the results possible with a very active uh, national market development policies. Uh, the result is that 80% of Danes buy organic food now, 50% uh, buy every week. We have 13% of the market share, but for many basic products uh, like uh, milk, eggs, uh, flour, some vegetables, so we have 30 to 50% of the food market now. And this didn't happen on its own. It's a result of a unified organic sector working on market development, but it's also a result of very active political policy. It requires both. Uh, some examples uh, of national policies is uh, consumer campaigns, uh, large events also where we have 5% of the Danish population out physically on an organic farm each year, uh, export promotions, uh, work in the supply chain, uh, mobile product innovation teams working with small companies, um, and then a very large effort in the public sector kitchens uh, with a goal of 60% organic, and then investments in the education of people in the kitchens to do not just organic, but also climate friendly and healthier food. And then a, an important tool in this is our organic cuisine label for 30, 60, and 90% organic, which is very motivating for the people in the kitchens, also the people who own restaurants uh, and, and hotels, but also for the consumers because they can see uh, documentation for the organic effort. So that's some of the what uh, has been done politically uh, in terms of market development. But I think the most important lessons from Denmark are frankly the how how, how uh, this was done. And here I think there are three lessons that could be useful in other national plans and also for the EU action plan. One is the very active use of national uh, organic action plans with a strong focus on market development. Uh, the second is the integration of organic farming but also market development in broader policy areas like biodiversity, like green economic growth, uh, like uh, protection of our drinking water and, pet and, and our food and our nature from pesticides. And each time organic uh, farming is used as a tool, there come resources and additional policy efforts to, uh, to support organic farming. But I think finally, the, le the most important lesson from Denmark is actually, in terms of driving market growth, uh, is, uh, is the unified market effort and the government's the support for capacity building in the organic NGO, Organic Denmark, um, to drive market growth um, by supporting critical market projects. It allows an organic NGO to hire uh, professional people from retail, food service, communications that can build the partnerships with retail, drive uh, serious communication efforts that actually win market share. So someone needs to do these efforts um, initiate these partnerships, fight for market share. The organic NGOs are the key ingredient and often the missing ingredient uh, to developing the organic market um, in the member states. So I think this needs to be a big focus. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Paul. And you, you can get uh, jealous. I mean, in Germany, we have a national organic action plan as well, but it looks like um, more like a tale than than uh, really happening, <laughs> but I, I think it's not that easy. Chiara, you had one. You want to add something because you pointed up your finger? No, 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 no. Okay. So um, because that comes to the question, you know, um, if you if you want um, like the, uh, the national pol 
politics and the sector representatives work hand in hand together, you need to have a strong uh, sector representatives. That's what you mean. But um, I think as well, uh, the national and EU policies um, have to have to do not to um, yeah you can say uh, put at risk what you can establish there. So do you do you see anything missing in national or EU policies um, that would help develop this organic market? Paul? Yeah, well, I think I think there's no way that we can reach the 25% goal for organic farming, and it would even not even be advisable if we don't invest massively in, in market development at the national and the EU level. And I would say that um, using these proven strategies, that um, the EU should really require states to do uh, organic action plans that also include market development, uh, so that we have a market when we increase production in the European Union. And I think uh, the, the Commission can also integrate to a much greater degree organic farming as a tool, uh, as we've done in Denmark, for broader policies, both redevelopment, cohesion funds, uh, research of course also. Um, and I would also recommend a EU-wide effort for sharing of best practice. There are so many lessons being learned about market development in, in all the European countries. We need to be together more like today, uh, more often to share these lessons and help train each other in, in a sense. And I think you know if the if if the IFOM EU group, for example, had resources from the Organic Action Plan to actually uh, build competencies in our organizations in market development, that would be very strong. And the last thing I think that's missing is real game changers that uh, create a fair competition, a level playing field price-wise between organic and conventional food. And this has to be done by uh, making sure prices reflect environmental impacts and lower VAT on certified organic food, taxes on carbon emissions, taxes on pesticides. There's actually, tax, taxes on pesticides in Denmark finance a number of these organic initiatives already today. And the cap support going to environmental actions from farmers and not just because they have some land. These things, these three game changers would, um, together with strengthening the organic sector, would uh, transform agriculture overnight and would make the 25% goal easily achievable. Yeah, I, I can imagine that. Uh, it sounds, it sounds like a really, really good um, approach um, to go into these uh, game changers. So, um, what also is a game changer is the time running we have here. So, I would love to, to um, go into details um, even more. Um, I see we have one uh, question, for example, from uh, Jan Plager. Maybe, Chiara, you are able to um, answer that question. Um, yeah. Maybe just yeah. just on perspective. I don't know if you have time yeah. for the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that uh, to change the consumer habits, so how to how consumer convert, uh, I think it's very important to explain to the consumer the benefit for uh, related to organic product and organic production uh, by the, the different point of view. I mean, uh, it's very important that uh, the consumer uh, increase uh, their awareness concerning the impact on the environment in terms of use uh, of pesticides, of techniques, uh, but uh, also in terms of uh, uh, health effect for human. And, uh, it, okay, of course, it's more complicated to explain uh, other kind of uh, information, for example, the condition and, and so on. Um, we, we think that the explanation to the consumer at different level and with the different uh, types of uh, communication and the instruments uh, is uh, is a basic uh, just to to, to increase uh, the the market uh, the market share of these uh, sectors. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you on that. Um, I um, got a note that uh, we have um, extended time limit now, so the main session will continue at at the, uh, 1 o'clock 20 minutes, so 20 past 1. So we end the session at 15 past 1, quite sharp. So we we um, got quite a nice present here, 15 minutes more. And I see more questions uh, rolling in. For example, uh, from Evelyn from Ecovalia in Spain um, to you, Paul. Um, I, I read it out loud. I think this is better if, uh, I don't know if everyone follows the chat. So. 
Evelyn asks, she sees the success of Denmark is based on horizontal approach, fixed objectives in numbers and suitable budget to perform it. Which was the start of that combination of well-addressed items? I think the, the, the coordination of policy um, and ensure, ensuring, I mean, a plan doesn't ensure a budget often. So it's a combination of, of lobby, it's an advocacy efforts both in developing plans, but also in ensuring budgets um, at the national level. So again, it's just that the organic NGOs need to uh, work on national budgets to ensure financing of the, the good policies that get developed, but sometimes never get financed. And I think making uh, the action plans actually allowed uh, coordination among uh, the different areas uh, within policy, uh, but also creating a kind of a simultaneousness between mobilization in the sector and mobilization of policy. Those really need to happen at the same time. Like in the public kitchens, we did a massive mobilization to ensure deliveries of the new products and, and, and a much better service to those public kitchens um, and did organic schools training people in the food service industry about organics um, at the same time that the people in the kitchens were being motivated by uh, goals and by education. So this kind of simultaneousness makes an upward going spiral between policy and mobilization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this um, this could um, could be even uh, more helpful if uh, maybe, for example, Evelyn or anyone else here from national NGOs needs any more details. I think feel free to get in contact with Paul Holmbeck because that's what he's doing now, and uh, maybe he can help you with the answers and national strategies as well. And every country is, country is different, I imagine, so it's not one answer to fix it all. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Uh, so uh, let's see which um, question to elect second. Um, uh, then as next question or third question, um, we have a question from Andre. Um, should we allow the win with organic ingredients as front of packaging claim for pack compound products when more than 75% of the agricultural ingredients are organic to increase the demand? I think this, um, Kara, maybe you can answer that. Um, would you do that yeah. with the core brand? Can, can you imagine limited to 75%? I think uh, it could be a way, not the only one. We um, follow it a similar way with the uh, transfer ingredients, uh, so the fair trade products. Uh, and uh, so adding uh, even a small percentage uh, in, the, uh, in the final product. Uh, of course, uh, it could be an important component uh, to increase the demand, uh, but uh, I, I want to underline another time that uh, um, the, the change of the minimum percentage in a product uh, in terms of uh, ingredient list, uh, um, it won't solve the effect on the consumer if uh, you do not uh, tackle the, the, the problem by different points. I mean, you have to explain very well uh, which are the ingredients and uh, the positive aspect of this uh, kind uh, and uh, of, of production method. Um, I think it could be helpful, but not the only solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Paul, uh, I would uh, give you the, the same question, but maybe uh, just a short answer. Is there um, an example in Denmark where you maybe support new, new products and which don't uh, have 100% um, of the ingredients organic, so they label it partly organic, I don't know. Uh, no, we're not, wild, we're not wild about the idea. Um, I think it creates a confusion about sort of semi-organic and organic products, um, and there are not many areas where it's not possible to create a completely organic product now. So um, we like to hold a firm line on that, and it gives that, much more confidence to organic products. And when you're seeing the word organic, 
that you're insured a total organic product. Um, and it's actually a motivation for companies to go all in. Um, so, so we're not so wild about that. There was uh, another question there I saw that came about the effectiveness of general uh, organic consumer campaigns versus retail-driven marketing efforts. That's a really, uh, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm not a huge believer in standalone uh, organic market campaigns because information alone won't do it. I think those have to be have to be coordinated with retail so that the the products are more visible in the store. Even the stores are being redesigned to improve sales of organics, and then also uh, we need events in addition to just uh, information because people need to actually have a, f a physical experience of, 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 of meeting organic agriculture. So that combination of something for your mind and something that you experience uh, centrally and then actually meeting things in the store, those all those factors together then create higher sales. Yeah, I, I can emphasize that um, you need to go be linked together, that's what you explained uh, had happened in Denmark. Okay, so um, we have quite some time uh, some time left. There was one question at the beginning, um, Chiara, in your direction. So you explained that the schools in, in Italy had to offer organic food in the canteens. So does it mean every school? Is it mandatory for every single school? Or um, is it okay. just a movement? starting uh, okay there was a, a rule which uh, defined uh, in Italy um, there is uh, this type of uh, uh, activity for the school canteen so um, there are national rules that define the characteristic of the product and of the service offered for, for the canteens but, um, there is a, a sort of gender so uh, and among multiple choices, the institution choose the, the service, the best service for the canteens. Um, this rule for the organic product, for the food uh, organic product, uh, regarded especially from the starting level of the school until the secondary level, first of all, and uh, it was uh, a preference element uh, of choice. It was not mandatory, but uh, it was uh, a very important preference of choice. And uh, mm, this is very important. Uh, there were also some activities uh, to explain to the, to the teacher, so to, to the adult with the children, of course, uh, uh, the importance of organic food. And this is, by our point of view, a very important element because uh, um, this, uh, the, the, the communication, uh, the education to this uh, kind of, uh, of food and of production, of course, uh, is very important that uh, will start since uh, uh, young, uh, young age. I mean, even the, the children uh, at different step uh, understood the, the, the difference, not the details, but the difference between organic food and standard food. Okay, thank you, Chiara. And maybe let me add some, uh, one another question regarding Italy, because um, it's quite not clear to me, and I don't know to everyone else, um, are there um, good umbrella organizations in Italy? Do you have the NGO developed um, regarding these um, school canteens? Um, if uh, Coop Italy wants to, I don't know, in, invest in this uh, sector, do you speak with the politics directly? If at any point, do you have any NGOs um, bringing you know, no. pre-competitive pre uh, NGOs? Uh, there is a, a national rule and uh, the action of these national rules uh, is uh, uh, left to the regional uh, management. Okay. By the other side, uh, Copitalia, uh, Copitali um, 
concerns only uh, retail, so stores. Uh, we do not care the service uh, of uh, of the canteens, Canteen. uh, but uh, yeah, but there are uh, there are specific and uh, specified companies uh, uh, caring about this kind of topic. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, this uh, this company must require the. Um, the specific requirements defined in, in the Italian rules. Uh, in the rules, they defined also the percentage, uh, the minimum percent, percentage admitted to have uh, organic food uh, in the in the proposal uh, in terms of uh, type of food and uh, uh, and variety uh, according the um, according to the uh, nutritional table timetable defined, of course. Uh, because in the canteens uh, is uh, quite complicated because they have to to match also with the nutritional aspect. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Paul, um, that comes to another question or one point you you said about capacity building. So, um, regarding Italy, would you recommend that um, it's okay if um, we have this uh, lack of NGO, but um, it's still working? Uh, for example, in the regional uh, levels, or would you recommend that uh, the, the retailers in Italy um, maybe uh, move on to uh, find her that the, an association or NGO working on organic uh, topics, like it is in Denmark? Do you understand my question? Is that a question to me? Yes, Paul. Uh, I said Paul. You know, if, yeah, what, do okay. you, what do you recommend to the Italian sector if there's well, a sector representative? Well, Italy, Italy is a much larger country, so, so region, regional representation. You know, Denmark would fit in a small region in Italy, um, but <laughs> but uh, I think there's a, a real uh, benefit of having unified organic market effort across um, national a, a total uh, national market because. When we develop a new uh, cam new campaign, new effort, then we invite all uh, retail uh, actors in, and many uh, come into to these campaigns. And so you get this kind of much larger effect, much larger visibility. People walk into one store, they go to another store, they see these campaigns, all these different places. So I think there's the coordination of a national effort, also in terms of communications, where you don't have you know five chairmen, but you know you have one um, that can communicate quickly when there's criticism of organics in relation to climate, for example. You know, just kind of reacting really quickly to the very active uh, media scene. So I, I think there's some real benefits of that coordination. Okay. Um, good. Um, I I think um, maybe a. Uh, uh, we, we uh, spoke about capacity building, about public campaigns, and uh, public procurement and campaigns as well. So another point mentioned but not discussed is this uh, true cost aspect. You know, um, does any one of uh, the two of you have an, an experience or example of um, maybe tax on pesticides or any um, steering involvement of the regulations? Regarding the true cost perspective, uh, yeah. Uh, so in Denmark, we have uh, pesticide fees, which are based on uh, use, but also the uh, how how potent these different pesticides are, and those funds from those fees are used for financing, among other things, um, the Fund for Organic Agriculture, which finances some. Uh, market activities and a lot of development activities of new practices and organics. And it finances another fund, which also finances um, various uh, research and market efforts. So, so that's a very direct example. Um, we also have some carbon taxing in Denmark. It's very low right now, but but there's just been a decision, a principal decision by a very large majority of our parliament to uh, to increase uh, carbon fees. We don't know how much. Um, but this would be another way of, of supporting uh, transformation in agriculture. Okay, thank you. Gera, do you have any examples in Italy or not yet? No, we have not, uh, we have not fee or taxes. Um, in my personal opinion, I think that uh, the, to have taxes or a uh, fee, uh, put it on a negative aspect, I mean, uh, um, not always a be the, the, the best solution. Uh, 
I think uh, that uh, probably um, a better solution would be also to um, to invest uh, budget uh, to implement uh, the positive way to be followed. I mean, um, only only tax or fee uh, without. Uh, a, a, a real surround, uh, um, a good situation around uh, uh, is not enough. It's not enough uh, and uh, we, we, we think that uh, the best solution would be to, to help uh, to promote uh, the organic production in terms of positive way, not to, to tax, uh, I mean, only the negative, uh, the, the use of pesticides, for example. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, now, we have uh, 11 minutes past uh, one, so uh, I want to do two things. Um, uh, we have time for a last question, and the, which was the last one in the chat um, regarding uh, what uh, Paul. And while while you answer, I um, uh, want to um, ask Teresa, can you please put in the the link to the poll? So. We had um, we prepared the poll, um, and you can click on that link. And please, um, we want uh, your interaction and your expertise as well um, here. And we have these, uh, like you can say, four measures, four actions. Um, what do you think is the most important measure how national governments or the Commission can push organic demand? So please click on that link. And uh, the results we will um, see here or in the main panel. And yes, so Paul, maybe you can please answer the last question from Martin Kunz. So he says that there are powerful lobby organizations from the conventional um, uh, groups and representatives. Is this a counterpart? Is this in Denmark as well? Can you? Uh, yes, it is. And we have a very powerful, very well organized uh, agricultural sector in Denmark in general. Um, and there is conflict, um, and we are up against each other uh, politically um, often. Uh, we're seeing it around climate policy and other areas. But our approach in Denmark is uh, what researchers have called constructive conflict where we, uh, we are in conflict with each other, we have very strong values, and it's important that our values are out there in the public because we're talking about what, we've, what we meet our opinions on uh, uh, genetic, genetically modified food or, or climate issues. We're also showing the organic values and actually promoting organics. But at the same time, we really need to collaborate um, with conventional agriculture because we see all conventional farmers as future organic farmers. So we need them to be positive towards organic farm, which they are becoming more and more positive and have some activities in the organic area. So they go back and forth between being in conflict with the organic organization and trying to kind of take, uh, take the momentum into their organization. So uh, we try to create a part of creating a really positive political ecosystem uh, for, for organics is having a good relationship with the conventional farm organizations but we do have conflict with them. But this whole approach of creating a positive ecosystem, that, that's for all organizations, all the environmental organizations. We try to appeal important to them um, for the environment or the animal welfare organizations or agriculture, what we can do for them, for their agenda, and then work as mm -hmm. well as we can together with them. Okay, very interesting. So it's this side-by-side -side being constructive destructive so yeah we reached our time limit so um thank you chiara thank you paul input it was very nice to have, have this extra time to speak with you and um sure. yeah, thanks to everyone here and uh, especially thanks to Teresa and friedhelm who managed to overcome all these technical difficulties and we managed to have a good and productive um, session here on the you, main chart, thank you. Um, on the main chart, you can see the result of the poll. And um, we start at the main panel at 20 past one. So you have seen Friedhelm and Teresa, you see the results of the poll. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, speakers. Thank Paul. you.
Thank you.